What's going on guys, my name is Matt, and while this might look like an old beat up Xbox on the outside, on the inside is actually a pretty powerful custom gaming PC. That's right, I fit a modern 6 core CPU, RTX graphics, and a ton more in this little box, and this is more than just some parts shoved into an Xbox case. I made sure to add some interesting touches like making the original power button work along with the green LEDs. It runs hot, it's loud, and it's not very practical, but I'm pretty darn happy with the end result, and I'm super excited to share the entire process of how it all came together. This is going to be a pretty long video, so enough with the preamble. It's now time to tell you the story of how I turned my childhood Xbox 360 into a modern gaming beast. So I purchased this Xbox all the way back in 2009. At the time, I was in middle school and I scraped together just enough money to buy the $200 Xbox 360 Arcade Edition and a copy of Call of Duty World at War. I have hundreds if not thousands of hours on this system and somehow during that entire time, I never got the dreaded Red Rings of Death. I used this system pretty consistently for about 3 or 4 years then would play on it occasionally up until about 2015 when I started to get into PC gaming. Before tearing it down, I wanted to turn it on and see if it was still fully functional. And don't worry, I have a plan for the internals which I'll talk about in a minute. Plugging it in and turning it on, I was greeted by the classic Xbox 360 startup screen, which was pretty nostalgic for me. I fired up some COD zombies for old times sake as I spent so many hours in middle and high school playing COD 5 and Black Ops Zombies. Then I loaded up GTA 5, which I kind of forgot was on the Xbox 360. It runs a little choppy, but the fact a game is large and expansive as GTA 5 plays on the 360 will always be mind blowing to me. So with that done, I could pull off my nostalgia glasses and get into opening this thing up. Opening up the Xbox 360 is quite annoying to do, but I actually had a lot of fun doing it because I can remember trying to open it up when I was younger, but once I got to the security bits I couldn't get any further and just gave up, so 13 year old me would be happy to know I finally am getting this damn thing open. There are tons of annoying clips and clamping mechanisms you have to carefully open even just to get the bottom plastic shell off. With that off, I could remove some torque screws which finally gave me access to the internals. I was honestly worried about how the inside was going to look, but for a 13 year old system with a ton of time on it, it was actually surprisingly clean. There's definitely some dust, but again, I was expecting much worse. Removing the SATA power and data cables along with this piece of tape allowed me to lift out the CD drive and revealed even more of the mainboard. Undoing one clip allowed me to lift off the fan shroud which revealed two 70mm fans positioned as exhaust. The way this works is cool air gets pulled through any gap exposed in the case and that shroud I just removed directs the air over the heatsink and then the fans can exhaust it out the back of the case. And after seeing this I decided I would hopefully try and replicate this type of airflow design in the final build. I disconnected and removed the fans then went to remove the front RF and power button board which is something I planned on adapting to work with the final build. Then finally I could remove like 15 more screws to release the mainboard. The Xbox 360 used a tri-core PowerPC based CPU designed by IBM and had an ATI designed GPU. There's only 512 megabytes of RAM which is kind of insane to think about how large scale of games that could run on this system. Now like I showed before, this Xbox is still 100% working and I actually want to build these parts into a custom case, so if you'd be interested in a custom Xbox 360 build, let me know in the comments below and I might just do it on camera. Now before starting this project, I did do some quick napkin math and sanity checking to ensure I could fit the parts I wanted, and while it did look like it was going to be a tight fit, I knew that it was possible. I planned on modifying and mounting everything to the original metal frame, but it was clear some modifications were going to need to be made. So I pulled out the cutoff tool and got to work. I started by removing this angular bent in part right here as I thought it might get in the way of the build. Then I went on to removing one of the sides to make sure both the motherboard and graphics card had room internally. Then I marked where the back IO was going to be and cut off the majority of the back metal panel. I was happy to see the main components fit but knew fitting the top panel on and even just getting a power cable to the GPU was going to be tricky. The next thing I did was hold the motherboard in place and mark the four mounting holes for it with a metal punch. I was originally going to epoxy some nuts onto those mounting points but this didn't work how I wanted so I just drilled out all four holes and decided to mount the board with bolts coming from the bottom and nuts on the top. This is a less elegant and more annoying solution but it's considerably more solid. 
For the GPU, I planned on mounting it horizontally using this PCIe right angle riser and attaching it like this. The big issue was even without a power connector, fitting the top panel was going to be a pain and would have been impossible with a standard power cable. But that's where this guy comes in. This is a right angle PCIe power adapter. They usually come in packs of two and are great for hiding your power cables on vertically mounted cards. As you can see, it plugs into the card like this, then the cable plugs in the adapter like this. Even with the right angle adapter, it was clear the top panel still wouldn't fit, but then I realized this is where the external hard drive sat. I wasn't sure if I was going to include this drive in the build, but I realized that if I hauled out the top panel and this hard drive enclosure, I could make the GPU power adapter fit. So I opened up the enclosure and pulled out the old 60GB hard drive, which will be used, or at very least its data will be used for the custom Xbox 360 project I talked about earlier. With the drive case disassembled, I could then go to town cutting out as much plastic as possible from the interior. Then once I stacked and glued all the pieces together, I would have a good bit of space for the PCIe power adapter to fit. To glue these, I just used some Gorilla Glue Gel Super Glue. I definitely wasn't as careful as I should have been and got some ugly smears on the exterior, but honestly, it kind of just adds to the beat up old Xbox slash sleeper look. So with the motherboard and GPU fitment figured out, I wanted to start on some of the front panel stuff all of the focus of which was going to be on this little PCB right here. This has the power button, green slash red LEDs, along with the RF receiver for the controllers. It also has this little piece that fits on top to help diffuse slash spread the light emitted from the LEDs. My idea was to solder wires directly to the different components, then use jumper cables to connect them to the motherboard. Luckily, there's a pinout for this board readily available online. Before I could solder anything to the board, I need to remove this connector as it protrudes into the case, which is room I needed for components. I originally tried to desolder the header, but I've never removed something like this and failed miserably. Luckily, with the help of my friend Mr. Pliers, I could rip off the connector, then just cut off all the leads with some side cutters. For wires, I'm just using various types of these jumper cables which I got a big pack of from Amazon and these along with everything else mentioned in this video will be linked in the description if you're interested. The first thing I soldered was the center green LED. It was super small and annoying to do. As you can see my hands were super shaky as I was nervous to mess it up. I did eventually get it though and then I wired the player one green LEDs in line with these by soldering them to the LED then connecting them to the positive and ground wires that would go to the motherboard. I'm not sure if this is really like a correct or appropriate way of wiring this up, but I'm a soldering noob and this is the best I could come up with. So first test the LEDs and sort of success. The center green one was lit up, but the player one LED was red, which after referencing the pinout diagram showed I had soldered in the wrong place. Also, for some reason, LED D3 was also lighting up. Try two was a fail, but the third time was the charm. The power button was super simple. I just followed the diagram and soldered one jumper to this pin and then one to ground. At this point, I thought I was done with this board, but then I stumbled upon this Instructables project that showed how you can wire this exact RF board to a USB cable and use it as an Xbox 360 controller wireless receiver. So I just had to solder four more jumpers to these top pins. These would connect to an internal USB 2 header on the motherboard, keeping the connection internal and meaning I didn't need to route a USB cable to the back of the case. With that done, I had a giant spaghetti mess, but everything was wired how I wanted it. So with that done, the final thing you might be thinking is how the heck am I going to power this system? A standard power supply is obviously out of the question, SFX is too big, and even Flex ATX is way too big. To get around this problem, I decided to implement the same design that was used on this Xbox originally, that is, have an external power brick that converts the AC to DC, then an internal DC to DC unit. Many times these come in the form of these little Pico power supplies, but I wanted to power a modern system with a dedicated graphics card. The only real option is the HDplex 400. Lucky for me, this is an amazing solution. It's expensive at about $100 plus the cost of a power brick, but it's super solid, reliable, and comes with short cables. I picked up this 330 watt power brick which is used for Dell slash Alienware laptops to go with it. Together, these two can power a pretty decent CPU slash GPU combo, and I'll be talking about each of the parts later in this video. The HDplex 400 should fit perfectly in the little spot behind the motherboard, and the brick will obviously sit on the outside of the case. 
case. With a power supply explained, let's talk about airflow. The Xbox is super closed off and the internals are cramped, so the only thing that could possibly fit is two tiny 40mm fans at the motherboard end of the case. These I taped in place, marked holes, then drilled four holes for each fan. These fit right on, and while I don't know how much they're actually going to help, at least I'm paying homage to the dual exhaust fan airflow design that the 360 originally used. With that done, I shifted my attention to the outer shell. I marked and cut plastic away for the motherboard, the GPU I.O., along with a hole for the power input. There was also a little time spent just removing any unnecessary standoffs or other plastic pieces that might get in the way of the PC parts. There's no more CD drive, so I took the front fascia from it, taped it in place, then fused it to the front panel with more of that gel super glue. Then, I just did the same thing for the eject button. With all that done, all the different pieces were pretty much complete, meaning it was time to put it all together and see if it actually works and how it performs, but before I assemble it, I want to talk about all the parts going into this build. Picking parts for this system was a bit of a challenge, as I only really had 330 watts of power available. After playing around with a few ideas, I ended up settling on a combination that's estimated to consume about 315 watts at most. For the CPU, I decided to go with the Ryzen 5 5600X. This is a 6-core, 12-thread CPU running on AMD's Zen 3 architecture. It's a great mid-range option that's perfect for gaming, streaming, and even video editing. Now, something like a i5-12400F would have also been a great pick, but I had both the 5600X and a compatible ITX motherboard on hand, so that's what I used. To cool the CPU, I went with a low-profile cooler from ID Cooling called the IS30. It's very compact, has plenty Plenty of copper heat pipes and overall worked decently well. I was deciding between this or another one, but by process of elimination, I had to use this one, which I'll talk about more later. For the motherboard, I went with the Gigabyte X570i A Aorus Pro. This is a pretty full featured ITX board with multiple M.2 slots and decent back panel I.O. One other nice thing is it has this kind of shielding on the back of the board, meaning I didn't have to worry about setting it directly against the metal chassis of the Xbox. It's kind of expensive, but that's to be expected with a high-end ITX board like this one. For RAM, I went with a low-profile Vengeance LPX kit from Corsair. This is a 2x16GB kit, so 32GB in total capacity, and it runs at 3600MHz CL18. This kit does take up all the RAM slots, but 32GB is more than enough for a system like this, even if you're wanting to do workstation applications. For storage, I just went with a 1TB Corsair MP400 NVMe SSD. This is a Gen 3 drive, but performance is pretty good, and 1TB was plenty for the OS, applications, and all the games tested. Now let's talk about the graphics card. What I ended up going with is an NVIDIA RTX 3060. This is the EVGA XC gaming model, which has 12GB of video memory, like all 3060s, and overall performs pretty well. The 3060 is a great card for 1080p and even 1440p gaming in a lot of games. With that being said, the RX 6600 performs pretty similar for less money, but this card fit very well into the build in terms of both physical size and power consumption. The power supply, like I talked about earlier, is this 400 watt HD Plex DC to DC unit paired with the 330 watt Dell OEM power brick. So now that you understand what's going into the system, let's finally put it all together. First, I installed all the parts that go onto the motherboard, like the CPU, then the cooler, then the RAM, and then the SSD. Before putting the board in the case, I did cover this metal bump out just in case it came in contact with the board directly. It probably doesn't, but better safe than sorry. I could then install the motherboard with the nuts and bolts I talked about earlier. With that in, I installed the PCIe riser cable. For the GPU, I removed the IO shield, put some foam on the shroud to act as a stand. I still have to find a good way of securing the card to the metal chassis, but for now this works fine. For the front panel board, I managed the cables, popped on the LED diffuser, and electrical taped the two exposed connections from the LEDs. This attaches with two screws, and the cables are easily routed into the main part of the case. I used more jumpers to extend these and plugged in the power button, power LEDs, and the four that go into the USB 2 header for the RF receiver. Then I plugged in the modular cables into the components, which include the 8-pin CPU cable, the motherboard 24-pin cable, and the 8-pin PCIe cable. Then I plugged all of those into the HD Plex and was able to set it into place, and I mean just look at that fit, 
pretty much perfect. Custom length cables would have made things cleaner, but the included ones with the HD Plex 400 worked out fine, honestly. I then went to install the fans and came to the realization that they would not fit with this cooler. See, I was originally testing with the Cryorig C1, which they fit with, but I was worried that cooler would be too tall. I figured I would proceed with assembly and address this later. I set the metal chassis into the bottom plastic cover. I attached the power input to the top panel, but had to remove it because it wouldn't fit between the motherboard and GPU the way I thought it would. When trying to put on the front panel, I found I still needed to cut some plastic away, but got it on. The bottom panel went on fine, but the top took some finagling. Plugging it in, it did turn on and was working, but the LEDs were kind of stuttering, and with me unable to fit the fans, I knew I needed to pull it apart and switch some stuff up. So I disassembled and pulled out the motherboard so I could replace the cooler and check the LED connections. Then I put everything back together and was happy to see it was fully functional. But I started to mess with one of the panels while it was running, and this happened. Yep, I broke some fan blades, so back to the ID cooling cooler it is, but this time I do think I can make the fans fit if I orient the cooler differently. And just like with soldering the LEDs earlier, the third time was the charm with assembly. I got it all put together and it was fully functional. Booting into Windows and firing up the first game on this completed system was super surreal, and just getting to this moment in a project like this where everything is working how you intended is one of the best feelings ever. So let's talk about the final product along with how it performs and how hot it runs. In the end, it does look a little rough around the outside, the top hard drive panel does stick out a bit and there is some panel gap, but at a quick glance, I don't think many people would think this is anything other than an old beat up Xbox. The back panel is definitely a bit rough and I have some ideas of how I could clean it up a bit. For example, just finding a good place to mount the power input so it's not sticking out the back of the case like a tail would be a big improvement. If you guys would like to see a part 2 of me just polishing things up, let me know in the comments below. Before running games, I knew I wanted to tweak some things to attempt to make the system run a bit cooler. So I enabled eco mode in the BIOS which set the CPU to use only 45 watts, and for the GPU I undervolted it a bit. I've never undervolted a GPU so I'm not sure how effective I was, but after doing these things the system was at least able to run games without crashing. Before I talk about temps, I want to run the benchmarks to show you what kind of performance this little Xbox sleeper PC is putting out. So as you can see, temps are pretty bad. The GPU was sitting in the mid to upper 80s most of the time and the CPU was well into the 90s for many of the tests. This really just comes down to a lack of airflow. I may try and use something like this server style cooler to see if it would help at all. But again, that would be for another video and I'll only make a part two if there's enough interest. All in all, I consider this project a success. It's rough around the edges, but I was able to cram a fully fledged gaming PC into an Xbox 360 case, which isn't something I've seen many people do. If you have ideas or suggestions for this build, any improvements or reconfigurations, let me know in the comments below. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. This project was a ton of work, so leaving a like and subscribing would mean a lot and will show me there's enough interest
dollars for me to make more of these modding projects in the future. Oh, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.